Well, welcome to this community snapshot. Two hats for every successful artist, creativity and business, by Mark Brock. Mark is an illustrator, a designer, and educator who has had a successful 35-year career. He has illustrated children's books, a poster for the Kentucky Derby, He's illustrated for Newsweek magazine and the Warner Brothers film, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, of course, and more. All right, today, we have a live audience here at the Linden House Art Center and online. And welcome, everybody. And now I want to welcome Mark. And thank you for coming today to teach us about the business of art and to help us understand copyright issues relating to the internet so that we don't unintentionally steal someone else's art. All right. There, there we go. Thank you, Lou. All right. Thank you, people here. Thank you, people that are joining us out there. Actually, I recognize some of your names. Uh, all right. Let's get started. Um, like she said, we're going to cover the, the whole idea of the business and art and the idea of actually making a living with what you do and some of the little things that kind of come up during all of that. First question I have is the... Um, Sorry. That's okay. There we go. There we go. These are some of the subjects, some of the topics that we're going to cover. Um, my first question is, is, what do you think the most valuable thing is once you produce a piece of art? What is the most valuable asset of that painting or sculpture or pottery or whatever. Anybody have any clues? I'm going to go with out, you know, either you folks outside or you folks in here. All right. And I'll just, yeah. The original? No. It's close. I mean, it, it, it's inherently that it is original and that it's yours once you finish it. The most valuable asset of any painting is the copyright. That's the next, that's, that's, the, that's the most inherent because that's where all the value is. And since roughly 1977, what that entails is a hugely more than what it was before 1977. In 1977, the copyright laws changed. They went from the inherent owner being the person who purchased it to the person who created it. That's a big deal. So, you know, Norman Rockwell and those guys, you know, Saturday Evening Post, prior to 1977, owned all, they owned all those paintings. Amazing. After that, Rockwell was the inherent owner of the copyright. Now, what that what that means, you know, a copyright is, and, and this is a brief definition of what a copyright is and what you can, you know, what you can and cannot copyright. So, the you know, past that, I mean, basically, once it's finished, the, that second you decide it's done, it's yours. So let's go to the, the next one. You know, what exactly are we talking about? And like I covered, the inherent owner is the creator. You know, where do you get a copyright? You get a copyright from the U.S. Copyright Office. And at the end of all of this, there is a, a web, I'll give you the website and where you can get all, and there is a huge amount of information there. Another kind of disclaimer I'm going to say is that if you have lots of really technical questions, an attorney is a wonderful thing. Because it's gotten really complicated in this day and age. There's digital rights, you know, everything that goes along with what a copyright is. Because you have a painting, you know, you can sell that painting or rights to that painting, you know, a hundred times and still own the original. They're all separate entities. And that's a big deal. And that's kind of where, you, as an artist, you can kind of make some money and actually keep the lights on and live inside and eat. That's a good thing. So, you know, it protects basically your painting and the rights. The rights, the copyright protects people reproducing your work in any shape, way, or form. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. And how to track all of that, um, I think, you know, the next thing is, is that, you know, how do you establish that value? What is that value? of your painting or your sculpture or your piece of art or whatever it is that you've produced. That's a big deal, too. I've, I've got to, you know, you've got the cost of materials, you've got the value of your time, you've got taxes and overhead, can't forget those people. Um, you've got the market value, because some artists obviously are going to be worth more supply and demand and all that kind of thing. 
And then you've got the usage slash publication. Those two words are kind of interchangeable. Um, I, I, I put together a really quick example. Um, let's just say that you're paid $1,000 for a 22 by 28 inch frame canvas painting. First thing you got to do, Uncle Sam, our governor, all that kind of stuff, you can take 30% out for taxes. So that's gone out of that $1,000. Next thing that happens, so let's say you're selling it through a gallery. A lot of galleries take 50%. Is that, am I right there with a lot of, so they take, so you take 50% out of that. The next thing you have, you know, I, I actually went on Dick Blick's site, and so there's a quick plug for them. You can go down to the loft too, so protect the local guys. Um, 2650 was for a stretch canvas of that size. Uh, roughly materials, 50. It, you know, you can't really judge how much paint you're going to use and all those kind of things. I didn't put anything in there in shipping because it may not, you don't know if it ships. Do you want a digital capture? Who pays for that? Digital capture is something that, you sh that I recommend that all artists get is that they get some sort of a digital image of whatever it is they produce for their archive. That's a good thing to have. Those cost roughly $30. And then your time. Now, I was real, real conservative. Let's just say you spend a 40-hour week at $5 an hour. I'm bad at math. $200. So your total cost to do this painting was $1,260. Oops. <laughs> Fell just a little bit short. But, and this doesn't even take into account the next issue I want to talk about, which I believe is usage and publication. That's another thing for the value of your paintings. And you've you got to understand, I'm going to say paintings, but that involves anything that is copyrightable. Music, sculpture, anything that you create. Um, what that involves is like, uh, you've got how long, what is it? You know, you're not going to charge, it's not the value of something that you sell to a Fortune 500 company for like, for what I deal with is like mass consumption. I'd say the package for an orange juice can, and you do a painting for that. Its value is going to be intrinsically a lot more than, say, something you do for, say, a not-for-profit poster that's going to be up for a week. So the value of what it's going to be used, how long is it going to be used? Is it something that's going to use a long time? Geograph geography comes into play. Uh, there we go. You know, how much of the copyright do they want to do they want to own? Do they want it just for that usage? Do they want it just for that poster? Or do they say, gee, we want to use it on billboards, we want to use it on this, and we want to own the original. You gotta remember that the original is a separate entity. It's kind of hard if you think that each usage, whether it's you know, like billboards is one life of the painting, an advertisement in a in a um, newspaper is another, magazine cover is another. They're going to use it on stationary, any usage. Every particular thing is actually a value. And so, and the original is also its own entity. You, I, I know in my own instance, I very rarely sell the original. I sell the rights. And they're specific rights. So that helps me judge what the value of that's going to be. Um, geography. Are they going to be able to use it just in the United States? Are they going to be able to use it? I think I had one contract that said throughout the universe, which was pretty aggressive. Um, how long? Do they want it just for a year? Do they want to use it for a number of years? Do they want it for infinity? Um, and all these things, usage equates to compensation. Uh, I know, let's see, like I said, well, uh, something I'm more familiar with, let's just say the covers. Uh, the Scholastic did for Harry Potter. There are roughly 30 covers throughout the world, roughly, give or take. The one that we're familiar with, they're only allowed to distribute that. They have the rights for North America. That's it. So that's why you see all these other different covers. Those publishers have the rights to print and sell within their geographic location. If there was one if there was one publisher that had the throughout the universe clause, 
that would be a hugely much more expensive endeavor for them. They probably couldn't afford and they just decide they don't want that. So these are things that you take in. How it's determined, this goes back to that negotiation that you have with whoever's hiring you. Um, I tend to, when it comes to business, I like to talk all that out in the beginning, in the very front of it, do that up front, get it in writing, and then put that chapter behind you and go on to create. Contracts are not for when things go good. They are for when things kind of fall off track and everybody has an assumption of what's supposed to happen. That's why you try to put it in writing and try to be really, really clear. I did print out a brief thing of questions that I ask when somebody calls me. First thing, obviously, you get the contact information. I want a brief description of what it is that they're asking. I mean, even things as simple as when they say, you know, how is it going to re be reproduced? You know, when they give you a size, this is really silly, but you got to ask them, is that vertical or horizontal? If that comes into a big place, someone says, I want an 8.5 by 11. And you assume that 8.5 by 11 means that it's going to be a vertical. Because usually the first number is the horizontal, the other one's the vertical. Some people don't know that. Well, that's a big deal when it comes to doing a magazine cover. If you do a horizontal, horizontally formatted pr uh, product, and they're expecting a vertical. You both went on an assumption. So it's always good to ask as many questions up front. And once you get all of that down and you get everything that you want out of all of those, all this information and all these questions, send them an email. Email is great. It's, it's almost like a contract. You know, you send it say, this is my, this is what I presume that we agreed to. This is what I interpret that you want. And then they'll send back and say, okay, that's right. Or they say, oh, no, we missed, we missed the boat here. Get all this stuff settled out up front. Because then you can go and do your creative thing with not as much worry and no surprises. I mean, none of us like surprises. I mean, I, I, I like to use auto mechanics. We go in and say we want to paint it red. Well, okay, and it comes back and it's not the shade of red we wanted. Oops. Who's at fault? Now you've got a whole ugly battle to deal with. So I think as, mu as often as you can nail down all the questions, no matter how silly, it's better to ask a stupid question than to have an action of the same variety. It just doesn't work. And everybody ends up, and you've got to understand, at the end of the day, these people that have contracted you or asked you or commissioned you, they hold that pen that writes your check. <laughs> which makes it tougher to get it, you know, if they perceive that they're right, it's going to be tougher for you to convince them that they're wrong. So it's better to kind of agree up front. I have found that process to make the assignments less troublesome. Um, does anybody have any questions? I, I forgot to say, if you have questions along the way, this is a huge amount of information or a huge subject to cover as far as copyrights. I mean, even... I, I know one thing that I want to talk about is images that are possibly copyright free. And I say possibly. I mean, I brought, where did I put it? There it is. These are the extra notes I have for a brief session. The copyright, um, let's talk about um, life of a copyright. And I, I, this is all about life of a copyright. This, whoops. Block you off, how's that? No. Um, this amount of paper is about the life of a copyright. I pulled this right off the copyright, the US government copyright site. And this is all the variations of copyrights and how long they last. Generally speaking, it's life plus 75. Life or life plus 70, I'm sorry. Life of the author plus 70. That's generally what it is. There are also these things that say, you know, things that aren't copyrighted, there is this, and it's technically true, if it's, pro, if it's published before 1923, it's technically copyright free. That is unless, of course, somebody has gone in and filed for a copyright for it. There are a number of people that make, I see some people here from Burton, Burton, quick plug for Maxine. Um, 
But if it's they had they, one of the people that they do work with, their entire library of art is work that was 1800s. And what this gentleman has done is he went back, found this art that was copyright free, copyrighted it in his name. So now, huh? That is absolutely legal. If there is no copyright on it, you can go in and do it. And there are a number of people that I know personally that have done that. So just because it's published before 1923 doesn't necessarily mean that it's copyright free. The things that you see on the web aren't necessarily copyright free. You know, like little pictures, little videos. You've got to be careful with songs. You can use phrases from a song, but you can't use the song lyrics in entirety. And like I said, this, this I don't know, it looks like about 20 pages of just the life. And that's why I say if you have real, real technical questions and really detailed ones, find an attorney that, that's real familiar with copyright law. It's a big deal. And it really is the value of what we do. That, that, that's where the value of what we do lies. Because for every one of those uses, you, there's an opportunity. Somebody could make money off of it. Like I said, I very rarely sell the originals to my stuff. I keep them. Now, I've had people buy them, but that's separate. That doesn't mean that they own the copyright to it, which is when you sell paintings and you sell things, make sure that you know you have a little agreement that says this is what they're getting. If they buy your painting, say, you bought the right to the original. That does not include any reproduction rights. And that's fair. If they want reproduction rights, then no problem. Here's the cost. You know, and that's that's the kind of thinking that, as artists, we need to get ourselves into more and more. Because that's, I, I, I really believe that that's where the value is in what we do and what we create is in the copyright. How to copyright? Um, you find it with the government. There is, and, 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 I, and, I, you're, and I think in those handouts, I think that website is on there in one of the handouts. There are a couple of sources that I went into, uh, the Graphic Artists Guild, uh, have a handbook, and they talk about the value of these rights that I've kind of gone through, and they cover it. Now, they cover it in a very broad sense, because they can't give specific prices because they got in a little bit of trouble. They used to do that, but it sounded like they were kind of manipulating the market. So now they do it in a large range. So if you do a painting, maybe it's between 200 and and $1,000. They also have sample um, contracts and agreements. If you use models, get a model to sign a model release. It's a real simple thing. Just you know, just kind of cover your base because you don't want that model to come back and go, well, I didn't know it was going to be for that. You can't use it for that. They're just they're little things that make the whole creative process a lot more fun. Um, and because I, I don't worry about the business part once I settle this up front. I don't lift a pencil to sketch until we come to an agreement because it may not go anywhere. We may not come to an agreement. So why, you know, go on the clock for free? I see a lot of glazed looks. This is the nice thing of having an audience. <laughs> I started sitting glazing over. What? Good. Oh, here, 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 here. Question number one, um, you said emails are very useful. Is an email a legal contract? If somebody says to you in an email, I will buy this or I will do this, does that um, hold them to a contract? It sure helps. I mean, because, you know, it, it's time Mark, get those. Oops. It, it, it helps a lot. It sure helps because it's time dated. It comes from their email address. I mean, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to track a conversation and an intent. Obviously, the absolute best is a contract. And it doesn't have to be horribly complicated. I think a lot of people think of contracts as being these huge stacks of paper. They can be very simple as long as they state everything that everybody wants to cover. Obviously, the more that's in a contract, you know, the more you're trying to cover and protect yourself. And they're trying to... Most contracts start off stating that you own the copyright. 
All the other pages talk about how you're going to negotiate those rights away. And for whatever compensation. Okay, question number two. Uh, I understood that you owned the copyright with just because you made the work. But from what you said, I got the impression that you didn't own it unless you legally registered it. It may. There's my ex. There's my ex. That's a good question. I mean, technically, yes, you do own it. But if you want to protect it, really protect it, register it. So, I mean, yes, technically, according to the law, you are the inherent owner of the copyright. But if you really want to protect yourself from people violating that copyright or using it without, it's better to go ahead and register it. And you can do it on, you can do it via email. You can do it online. And there are ways to do it where, let's just say, you want to do a gang of stuff. It does get pricey. I think it's 35 40 bucks a piece. But let's just say that you decide you want to put together a collection of stuff you did in, like, 2012. And as long as it's very specific of what's included in that portfolio of 2012, you can copyright it as a body of work. They haven't come down legally if that's okay or not, so they're allowing it to happen. There are copyright laws happening constantly. I mean, it's just, that's why I kind of checked the site, and it just seems that's why I really I'm going to disclaim and say call a lawyer. Okay, question number. Did I did, did that answer that one? Okay, question number three. I have a blog, and very often I would like to just lift a little illustration off the internet, mm -hmm. and it's not any big deal. Like the other day, I wanted a skeleton. And I was totally lost as to how to find a free image of a skeleton that I could put on the blog. In one of my massive collections of paper, I have that. Um, there are, you can go to some sites and they do have royalty free, copyright free type stuff. Um, Uh-huh. They wanted a fee. Well, this is a tough question. Obviously, the best thing in the world is to take your own picture. Um, it's, you know, you wouldn't like it if somebody used one of your things without permission. Now, a lot of I know I do a lot all the time. I've done things where I've included everything from the Rose Bowl to something, I'll just call them. Do you mind if I use this picture? Do you mind if I, do we need to send you anything? I go, no, I already got it. I just want your permission. No problem. Here's what it's for. Nine times out of ten, you get their blessing. So it's better to ask first because if it, it turns into a cease and desist thing and lawyers involved, it gets ugly. Um, if at all possible, try really hard to find out who did it. Give them a call. Here's what it's for. Otherwise, you're running a risk. I, I can't, I can't endorse doing that. I know it's done, and people, it happens all the time. Wait a second. You need to. Okay. okay. We'll hold your question until after the well, program. I'll, I'll just repeat. Can I okay. just repeat the question? Okay. Okay. Um, She was. She spoke about sites like Tumblr, uh, Flickr, and those kind, and YouTube. The disclaimer says that those organizations they have not, they have no idea who owns a copyright. That's up to whoever posted it. And have people who have posted things that have violated copyright have been pursued. But sites like Flickr and stuff, what they do to indemnify themselves is to say. 
we understand that you're posting this, letting you know, believe, letting us believe that you own the copyright. We're not endorsing that you violate anybody's copyright. So that's how they kind of get away from that, and that's how those sites happen. It's a good question. My question about the, the free imagery, I can't help but think about all those fonts that are in Word and, and on your computer fonts. They include dingbats, which are little pictures. Uh, can we use any font? Can we use all those dingbats, like if we need a skeleton? Yeah, right. You know what? Because you, you own the cut, you, you have a license with that, with that font. You're entitled to. You can do that. I, Elizabeth put something up too. The other, the other um, advantage, this is Elizabeth DeLumber. I don't even know why she's here. <laughs> she's here to help me, is what it is. Um, that's the other side when you register is that you, you will be covered in a legal situation for your court costs and if you win the claim, of course, your legal fees. And that's a big deal. So there's an extra, another added bonus to having it registered. Whoever you beat, whoever you win the suit from. So if, if somebody violates your copyright and you file suit against party A, and party A loses, party A's, they're obliged to pay your legal fees in addition to everything else. You're, to, you're entitled to get that from them. It's not so the other way. You may not get them the other way. It's more of a struggle if it's not registered. It's a gray area. So the idea of mailing something to yourself isn't, doesn't really help as far as that, you know, ironclad legal protection. You can do it, and you know you can prove. I mean, basically, you're trying to prove who did it first. Copywriting seals that deal. There is no questions asked, and it makes it for a very quick, usually settlement out of court. Yeah. I have a question. When when I am doing a creative project. I often look on the internet for ideas or to see, you know, what what other people are doing on the subject. Sometimes I'm just looking and an idea pops into my mind. Where is that line between copying and just being inspired by something? <laughs> uh, this is a huge gray area. I can hear some people laugh. Oh. Has Elizabeth got a question? I, I, I can imagine she's laughing her mind off on this one. Um, that's a great question. You know, what's the difference? As far as is the yeah, I knew it. I knew it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, but basically, when it comes down to a court case, they'll put the two images up and say, "Did they steal?" And I mean. In, there's a, I think most of us have a conscience that you know when you cross that line. If you wouldn't show it to your friends or other, your peers, then there's a good chance you cross the line. That's how I always look at it. It's like, okay, what's influence? What's uh, plagiarism? And it's like, have I gone too far? Well, if I don't want to show it to a fellow professional, I cross the line. You know, if you can't look in the mirror, <laughs> That's, that's always a good time. And these things always happen. That doesn't mean you can't be influenced. But that is a, it's a great question. I just don't know if I have a great answer. I, you have to really kind of watch yourself. I mean, because guaranteed, if, if you put something out there and you cross the line, um, there's a good chance that you're going to hear from your peers, if not your peers' lawyers. <laughs> so, any other questions? I tried to get through a bunch of stuff because I know this is a kind of a tough an uncomfortable subject for artists. I mean, we like to think it's like, oh no, I'm an artist, that's going to ruin the creativity. I have found it to make the creativity go that much better. It's nice when you know what you're going to get at the end of the day. I like that. And I like being able to know, it's like, okay, this is fair. And everybody knows what they're going to get. It's no, like I said, it's no different than taking your car into an auto mechanic and, you know, you expect certain things to happen when you drop that car off. And if those things don't occur, you're unhappy. And now you're, not, you're reluctant to pay that person. <laughs> well, look at your clients the same way. 
You want them, and, they're, and they're, trust me, they're going to tell all their friends if it was a bad experience. Just as much and maybe more than if it was a great experience. So this just makes my life a lot easier by, by hammering out all these little details. And, and I have no problems, you know, contacting any source I can to make that go smoothly. Or if I have, I call fellow professionals that, you know, if I have a question, if, it, if it's a kind of a job that I'm not used to and I have no idea how to price it, I'll call somebody up. I might not even know them. I mean, I, we may know each other's names, but we've never met. I say, look, I know you have experience in this. Can you give me an idea of what's a fair market price? Because that protects them as well as me. Because if I go in and I start giving a price that's like a third of what the market price is, suddenly the rest of the market's going to have to charge that same cheap price. Oh, we got to mark this price. Why can't you do it for this price? It helps everybody. So, I mean, and I think the business side of it, you know, we can't, we can't ignore it if we want to make a living at it. And, and they respond to this idea that artists are kind of starving and stuff like that is usually perpetuated by people that have to pay for it. And we allow it. I mean, you've got to understand, we're equally as guilty in this whole process. We let it happen. We say yes. 